Saxon, Kelly Lynch, Julian DeLeon, rehearsal director. So I wanted to find a way to tie this lectern back into process, mostly because of what I feel like I've been really discussing with my comp students. And um, what I have found is that at a certain point, I mean, process and research is a huge part of how I develop a piece. But at this point, we just premiered Marksman, and um, I'm still apprehending it and figuring it out, but we're remote from where we began. So as we started to think about how to break back down to its origins, source is we're kind of far away from that, actually. So I'm going to rip little phrases out of the piece, completely out of context and show them to you as ideas about where research might have landed into development. And I'm going to try and give you a little taste of what an early research idea might look like. So um, Marksman, just for me as an artist, every process feels really different. And I'm sure there are commonalities that I use, but I don't know what they are. I feel like I go into the... <coughs> I go into an intuitive, dark place with every process where I'm lost in the dark, and that's what I like. I want to be, I want to be in a place where I don't understand and I don't know, and therefore everything is possible. So I try and sit in not knowingness for as long as I can, and actually I enjoy it, to be honest with you. Um, it's the part where I have to start making choices and commit, and. And edit, ruthless editing I also enjoy, which is the farthest edge of process, but the middle part where I have to choose what I'm going to really develop toward meaning that matters to me, that can be quite painful, because it's like um, moving away from open-endedness. So some of what I'm showing you has moved away from open-endedness, but it started in a really ambiguous place. And out of that ambiguity, I saw something that excited me and we followed it. All of us, I mean, that's part of the exploratory process. So, um, and it's also about watching dancers' uniquenesses, <coughs> not just their physical uniquenesses, like where their center likes to be, or, but also their temperamental uniquenesses. Like, can, can they tolerate um, psychological intimacy? Are they more comfortable at a distance? H how do I um, engage with that? And accept it and understand how it can inform the piece. Um, so those are things that I think about a lot in process and bounce off of. So I'm going to ask um, Julian and Doug to do an improvisation around some really early research stuff. And we, we end up naming things, you know, like you do in process. And this comes out of jelly research, okay, <laughs> where um, it's kind of a jelly and eel research, 
which, um, which came originally, I mean, I know it sounds stupid, but I'm dead, uh, came from dry pointing, where dry pointing turned soft and started to morph. Okay, so that's maybe one energetic clue. Marksman is really about an investigation of energy and then its kind of human consequences. So um, we're going to do a jelly elk improv. And it will start jelly because it starts with Julian agitating Doug and it will turn into elk a little bit more when Doug agitates Julian. Oh, eel. Sorry, eel. And no, and elk came from eel. Sorry. Yeah. This is, but these are not actually animals, eels and elks. It's the energy of eels and elks. far less ambiguous than an improv would be early in research because they actually know a lot about where this research has headed already. Uh, so let me show you a concrete phrase. So we would have taken, um, I mean, we didn't know that we were interested in jellies and eels and elks initially. We, we got there through time because I was watching endless open-ended improvs and I started to pinpoint what I, what I wanted to follow, what leads I wanted to follow. And then we started to make concrete material out of it. So this is an example of elk, eel phrase, which actually started on Julian and another dancer and eventually got transferred to Thryn and Ryan, so they're gonna dance it for you, um, with uh, elk.
solidified, but certain things were interesting to me, like a sort of primalness and something kind of masculine about Thrin's energy in there, and obviously some sexuality, and I don't know, certain things about that were in, remained interesting to me, so we sort of zeroed in on them. And this is a different direction from the same research called Hot Jelly. Let's have um, Ryan and Kayla. <laughs> and uh, are we using sound? Yes. So you know what she is? how we made these things a little bit. Um, that one in particular, we were all in the studio. So we do this um, sort of poking and things that you saw. But this one in particular, because we were going in a different, we were trying to go in a different direction in the same vein. Um, we sat there and we're like, pull his ear, hit his leg, smack him on the chest. 
you know, don't we use your hands. don't use your hands. Yeah. So we were we were just trying to give as many influences, and literally all <laughs> four, five of us were just yelling things out at them, and they were doing all of them. So this be, it was hot jelly before because it was a very sparky duet, and the the, the stuff that Julian and I just did is a is the jelly duet that we do that's a little more. We call, we call it sea jelly. Sea jelly. Uh, Underwaterness. <laughs> um, which and but there's there's a thank you, Deb. but there's also um, there's also meaning written into sea jelly in my mind because there's a power structure. The person not there's a vacancy to the person who's responding, and yet in a way they're the one creating um, meaning through form. So there's kind of an interesting. Oh, you haven't seen sea jelly, so this won't make sense. But you will in Mark's movie. So, but um, let's keep going. So that was uh, sort of heading slightly more toward relational imagery. I want to backtrack for a minute and talk about um, a vein of research from Marksman that I was really fascinated by, which is how to show form forming, like um, how to create architecting, you know, and, and um, upward sand castling or edifice building um, kind of ideas. And some I was really interested in heavy architecting, so steel things falling or construction, and other things were much more delicate, like how to create very quick filigree listening signals the way insects can, for instance. So um, let's start with uh, floor architecture, which is heavy. Okay. <laughs> and I'm going to put two phrases back to back that are actually juxtaposed against each other, but. To me, they hold quite different energies. So, floor architecture. Necessity or inevitability is sort of written into that, so there's a he beautiful heaviness to it, and then some pushing against. This is a slightly earlier research around similar things, this sort of anchoring the weight. And I think one of the reasons I was got really fascinated by anchoring is because um, Marksman originated as a trio between two men. Julian was in the original trio, and um, a woman, and the woman was smaller, and I wanted them to feel like equal masses, equal densities when they were dancing together. So I worked a lot on how to create this feeling that one thing would affect the next as though these masses were equal. Um, so this is another version. It's slightly more anchoring, I would call it, uh, than the version you just saw. And it also contains a kind of anger which grew out of that paradox of trying to make a woman as heavy as two men.
Let's stop there. That was beautiful, guys. Good. Okay, I'm going to show you three little short phrases that are a little more finicky architecting. Um, and these are all just plucked out of marksman, out of context. But uh, I love watching things in silence, I have to say. <laughs> uh, it really uh, reminds me of how powerful the rhythms are inside the material already. Although the music for marksman is very interesting. Um, so let's look at hydraulic gate, French, and Egypt back to back. So just walk in and start again, okay? These have nothing to do with each other, but I think they contain commonalities in a funny way. Beautiful. Okay, let's do this. <laughs> French. Good, and we can stop there, guys. Beautiful. Okay. Um, and this is Egypt. So just watch for what carries through these three phrases and see if you can see what I see, which is that they have certain things in common. This is early, much earlier. This is very early architecting. Good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, good. Um, do you see that those three ideas sort of have a, a, a through line in a way? I use them in very different places in the piece for different reasons, but um, one thing that's interesting about developing a big palette, okay, so I'm going to show you this right now, which I'm going to show my comp class tomorrow in more detail, is that this is, happens to not be marksman, but this is something that I do. I have to land on at some point for every piece, which is a map, an associative map of all the research we've done. And I'm trying, I'm not making, is this up right? I'm not making um, 
sense of it yet. I'm just sticking it down on the page, and the only sense I'm making of it is what might connect energetically, or where leads might point. Um, so it's, for me, it's a very intuitive process. I write down all my research, and I think, could this point toward that? Could that point toward that? Could these hook? Um, would this be an interesting thing to jiggle against that thing? Would this provide texture? <coughs> and you know, Doug said something in his Q&A that I thought was really interesting about how he finds the material that fits the moment. That's a, that's a real intuitive art form for a choreographer, and I, I think about that a lot. How do you find the right resource for the moment? And um, associative maps help me, especially when I've done a ton of research and I have a broad and fascinating palette then I have to figure out how to be willing to murder the things that I'm attached to that may not matter in the piece. So that's where the ruthless editing comes in. And I'm actually pretty good at that. I can be very ruthless, but it's narrowing down to choices that, um, uh, it's like taking this map and figuring out what, where to go, what to follow. And actually, the first step I call Frankensteining because you just have to push it next to other shit. That's how I handle it. You know, I just put stuff up there Frankenstein it and think about what to do next, basically. So sometimes I stay in a Frankenstein moment, which means there's real awkwardness compositionally for a long time. And yeah, that's just my, you know. Okay, so let's move forward. Um, so central trio. Are we ready for central trio? This is, uh, this is gonna be straight out of Marksman, and this is an important trio for me. Um, I feel like it sets up a lot of thesis elements of Marksman, and um, uh, we're gonna hit it half, part way through, okay? And Egypt finishes this, by the way, but we're not gonna show you Egypt, because we just showed it to you. <coughs> Kelly, uh, Julian, and Ryan. Thank you. 
See what I'm talking about? How something, t some mass tips and causes the next effect to happen. Like uh, um, I was interested in um, the willfulness or the uh, intensity inside a natural domino effect, and we use that kind of as a formal structure to build this material. Um, and the equalizing of weight between forces. Did you guys see any of that as well? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So let me show you a different version of dominoing, where it's sort of got more um, about bouncing the energy off through dominoing. So I want to show um, tipping trio and then bouncing trio back to back. Same structure, energized differently. Might be interesting to see. Kayla, Ryan, and Thryn. Um, you guys, yeah, come downstairs. Let's try, let's try the bouncing version. Uh, come downstairs a little bit. Diddy, this is also coming out of this same bouncing research, uh, a little more slappy. It's an Irish jig. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So um, I just give you some example of how our palette, how we research, and then I'm finding ways to weave these energies into a larger work. And, and the big thing is to apprehend a large structure and figure out how to make meaning through time. And you know, that's a constant um, discovery process, I think, for any choreographer, is time flexing 
from these small ideas to really large ideas, like a 50, you know, it's a 50 minute work, this piece of 50 minutes, five minutes. Um, and I also feel like I usually don't set out choreographically to prove something to an audience or follow a something that I know I need to, to, to make an audience understand. I follow my curiosity in the studio and the work builds out of those impulses. And then in a way the work reveals itself to me. Um, I know that sounds corny, but it really is true. I feel like I learn what it is I'm speaking about as I go through engaging with um, form, actually, and what underlies form. Dark Lark was a really different set of impulses, and I was trying to push myself in Dark Lark to think about presentation uh, and display and um, ego and um, well, definitely fantasy, yeah, but fantasy um, like the way, in a funny way, we all can create <laughs> like uh, hyper, hyperbolic versions of ourselves through fantasy. So this is, fantasy was kind of an inroad to explore performance at this high peak drama place. So um, Dark Lark centered around five solos that I really developed very much out of a specific individuals. Um, I had a butterfly solo on a dancer of mine, Leslie Krauss, who was with me for a long, long time and had gotten to a point as a performer where she could really control the eye. And I wanted to explore that. She could really like t control where and why you looked at her. And there was something about the hardness of that that was fascinating to me, and so I put it into an extremely feminine context, like thinking about the 20s and about butterflies and how they manifested, you know, this notion of femininity. Anyway, so that's an early piece of research. And then I was toying with other kind of archetypes like wolves, werewolves, um, pan figures, Dionysus. There was, Doug was in very, very, very high heels, like six inch <laughs> heels, you know. He was extraordinary in that role. He was sort of, um, you know, between feminine and masculine, but he had a slave, you know, who propped him up. and. Um, and then <laughs> boys, a boy slave. And, um, and then uh, we had the fan solo, it was originally built on TJ. And that was really, I think of it kind of as an offering, Doug will dance it. So Dark Lark had these kind of archetypal containers in it and um, different performers interpret these ideas very, very differently. So Kayla's doing the butterfly solo. Yeah. Props. We, we investigated props that round as well. So um, she's talking about a butterfly, like a, a costume butterfly, like a large orange butterfly that could be used in many ways. You had to figure out how to use it. There, you'll see a, a pole duet that we're about to show. Yes, um, that we found. We we happened to have. There was. We were in a studio. Broomstick. A broomstick. There was one of those like unscrewable. Actually, I, I, I wanted something, you know, like a tool to point uh, and tell you where to go, you know, like a um, teacherly tool. Or and the heels came out of that as well. Mm -hmm. and um, that was an interesting experience. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we would be touring. I love that piece on Doug, but those heels were so dangerous, you know, like, I mean, he was going to break. Seven inch platform heels. Yeah, he was going to break his ankle at some point, you know, so. Anyway, but um, Dark Lark is also a big big heavy duty production piece and that's one thing that's been interesting about touring it because you know different pieces also have different environments on stage and uh, we made Dark Lark at BAM um, in the dark dungeon space which I can't Fisher, Fisher. Fisher. And, um, and we made it with a, a live cellist who was extremely important Chris Lancaster was an extraordinary part of this piece and very vibrant performer and there's no way to replicate his score without him because he's a he's a performer who changes in the moment. He's in. He's an uh, amplified cellist who uses the um, what's the pedal called that you can layer the looping pedal. Thank yeah. Um, he used the looping pedal to layer sounds. So the butterfly sound. He'd gotten this um, bumblebee <laughs> pedal sound that was a very like that he used inside. So he had that on a loop as he 
as he bowed the strings, it made different high pitched or low pitched sounds that sounded almost like, you know, the cartoon butterfly when it's like, <laughs> <laughs> sort of like I'm doing a really gross version. <laughs> But, but what I really mean to say is that Chris was a performer who transformed in the moment as an improviser. He had a container and a structure. I work very similarly. The structure is tight, the basket's tight, but the performer lives it afresh. And so there's a lot of room for interpretation. And um, Chris was actually responding to the performers in the moment. You can't, you know, you can't pin down a score like that. So that's been one difficulty about touring Dark Clark, and the other is that it was extremely production heavy with costumes and complex, you know, stuff like that. So we paired it, set, yeah, well we have some of those, a couple of those, but we paired it way down to some kind of essence material, and um, it's also for me to think about it differently too. Uh, you know, I think I'm still trying to understand Dark Clark, basically. <laughs> Let's show Paul, um, which, yeah. Pretty self-evident, I think. Oh, actually, I want to show two versions of poll because this is what I think is interesting for lectern purposes. Kayla's going to do it first with Ryan, and then Thryn's going to do it, and you're going to see very, very different meaning, I think, because two different dancers are doing it. So that's what I mean by the container can hold, you know, individuality. Thank you. <clears throat> That's um, not the whole duet, but just a chunk of it, because Ryan's working hard tonight, so. <laughs> Thryn, let's have your version. Oh, do you need anything wiped?
idea what time we're at. Does anyone know? 8.17. 8.17. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, so come on out and sit for a minute. And um, I thought we'd just open this up to Q&A a little bit. Is there a way to pull the house lights up um, so we can see people? Thank you. That's great. Um, so I also thought we could talk not just about process and form and um, building pieces and dancing pieces, but also just life, like what it's like to be a dancer or um, whatever's on your mind, really. Uh, if you have any questions for any of these dancers or thoughts to share with us or questions for me, please um, shout them out. Yeah. Um, I have a question about your time at CalArts. How was the atmosphere there influencing your work here? Um, just because um, I see a lot of things that can be, in the sense of playful, avant-garde, or just out of the box, and CalArts is a very out of the box place. So I'm just curious how For sure. that time there. Yeah, CalArts was a wonderful um, place to go to school. I was an undergraduate there, and uh, I, you know, I think <laughs> some of the really um, important things I felt at CalArts was that people were pushing toward their instincts and um, there was an acceptance of failure or um, making bad choices out loud as part of process. And that was a very important, so it wasn't targeted toward, um, the climate at CalArts was not entirely targeted toward producing, uh, as we were saying earlier in the comp class, hitting your mark. Right, it was kind of about like aiming <laughs> and seeing seeing what came from it and um, being able to explore out loud. So there was an active sense of discussion and critique, but I didn't feel like there was an overwhelming um, point of view about what was good artwork. And so therefore, many many different things could exist at CalArts. Like I remember, there was a girl Alaska in my um, when I was an undergraduate there who was struggling with being seen as a dancer, like struggling with her surface as a dancer. So she well, you know, came in one night and painted all the dance mirrors black. <laughs> and uh, when we came in for class the next day, there were no mirrors, which is kind of amazing. And she got in big trouble, of course. But <laughs> stuff like that happened at CalArts a lot. You know? Or I remember, for instance, there was a visual art exhibit um, that was uh, called our, our dean. I mean, our um, president, a kike, all throughout the main gallery. And he left it up. So that kind of thing was allowed to exist, this discordant. And I think that uh, research was really supported and failure. So that was a beautiful quality of CalArts. And there were many different kinds of ways to think about making dances. Because people are different, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so it's great to see you guys in this uh, studio with um, And I was wondering, what do you consider to be essential in sort of an inertial space for the creative energy to happen? And what sort of things are valuable, not only for you as a performer, but also as dancers, what sort of mm. feeling makes you create that work? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Um, Could you repeat the question? Yes, what kind of climate, what kind of feeling in the studios is, do we cultivate and is necessary for this process? Uh, not just me, but the dancers. And um, I want to let them answer some of that, but the number one thing that jumps to my mind, and it takes time to do this, to cultivate this, is intimacy and trust. Because even though there's a lot of power, play, and aggression in my work, I think it takes enormous connected connectivity to dance it well. So actually, um, intimacy is a, a forefront, you know. Um, we were just talking about this today, actually. <laughs> I think, first and foremost, as a dancer, what Kate has really emphasized and has been a challenge for me is the being exposed and vulnerable in front of everyone, and Kate herself, and at times allowing yourself to feel foolish if something isn't working or it's not being accomplished the way you expect it to because, I mean, all these dancers have incredible technique, but that's not the emphasis. It's the living in the moment with them and allowing yourself to make those mistakes and be seen in that light, which you would think would be just obvious for any 
experience with dancers when you're bringing art forth, but it's very different the way that it's approached with Kate, I think, as far as my experience is concerned. It's like very raw. <laughs> um, and it can be really scary, but that's probably the coolest experience being there. Yeah, I could go on and on, but. <laughs> um, being the senior member, um, we've, <laughs> the same thing, it's, it's cultivating that kind of familial um, atmosphere in, in the rehearsal space is really crucial. Um, I think we, early on, we were super, it was, ridiculously close, like maybe too close. Um, because we did everything together. We were such a small company, we were four to start off with when I joined the company and we were, we like, we ate together. I mean, especially on tours and stuff, we ate together, we made food, we drove everywhere together, like, oh, we're going to the theater now? Okay, we're all, we're all going to the theater now. Um, Those were the chicken wings days, they're long gone. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, exactly what Twin's saying too, is that like we need to be able to be embarrassed and vulnerable and um, go to places that we didn't think we could or be willing to risk those things um, And that's why when I'm like telling people in class I'm like you need to risk more you need to take more risks You need to go for it because holding back is not going to do you any good And that's what Kate is trying to cultivate all the time is pushing past your boundaries and finding where Something may be uncomfortable and maybe you go into that. Um, I remember we did this uh, We were doing improvs this early um, investigation and we were having one person be the sole center of everyone putting their hands on them and moving them um, throughout the room and it came up to be my turn and I'm like a huge I'm a huge caretaker so I'm like always making sure everybody's all right and you got water and you got elastic arm for your toes and um, <laughs> and it came for my turn and everybody started to move me and I immediately was moved to tears like I couldn't I couldn't take what it was and what it was to be taken care of and for people to move me up into the space and to really be that vulnerable, like to be taken care of. I'm, I'm one of four, like we were always like in the kitchen making food with my family and whatever. So it was like everybody had their place and was doing a job. And for me to just to let go was ridiculously hard. So being in that space and being able to feel like I could cry and that I was okay, it was really special. And that's what we try to cultivate is like that space that we can do lots of things. Mm -hmm. Which makes it sound a little, I mean, this, I remember that moment very well, but it makes it sound therapeutic almost, but actually our process is not therapeutic. It's, it's much more, <laughs> I just wanna make that clear. <laughs> We're not weeping all the time, okay? No, no, I mean, I just mean that, um, I think there is, um, there is a certain amount of safety, but there's also a pressure for risk in the room. So it's actually quite a rigorous uh, process and, and, and I don't think we head or stay inside of comfort very much. Although there is a point in the process where a dancer really needs to own that material. Like I remember with Hot Jelly, these two reached a point where they were like, back off, you know? <laughs> Let us feel this, you know? And then it got much better, you know what I mean? Like they had to take it away and inhabit. And that sometimes is a very private process. So there's different things. Yeah. I also think what, um, what struck me for Kate's work, because um, you do need to be able to take risks, period. I think you should as a dancer. I guess that's up to you if you do or don't want to take risks. But um, uh, what struck me in this work was the specificity of what she's asking for. Um, because there, can, there is an open-endedness in research and that could be all wonderful and you can continue to find yourself, but it's interesting having these specific places you have to, to go and it's, for me, it had a lot of resistance for certain, <laughs> it was aesthetically, it's not always my first instinct or my first choice. And it's interesting to take that friction and keep pushing into it to build these range. You'll get different tools and a different range for yourself. So you still have yourself within it and then you keep adding on these different layers and ideas. Um, so it's important to also be able to find someone that can challenge you in that way. Comp class, we've been talking about this. How do you winnow down and get very specific so that you can contain and direct what you're interested in through improvisation? And that's, um, yeah, I think just practice. Yeah.
Yeah, that's a great question. Like, how does a dan how does a dancer or how do these dancers stay connected to their own voices um, inside of or in dialogue with? Is a better way to put it? My voice, because I actually do feel like that's an extremely active dialogue in the work, and we've been exploring it in comp class too. Like, when a uh, form. Uh, this is my analogy that I love from John Donne, by the way. You know, that, that something gets heated from inside and outside at the same time to find its shape. So the dancer inside has this reservoir of experience that helps shape the meaning, and I am shaping it perceptually from outside, and we meet and press it into its right place. So when, yeah, that's what I was saying. How do you stay connected to voice and your own voice? Kelly, do you want to talk about that? Because you're, Kelly's, joined us about three weeks before our premiere. Just, you know, like serious pro. <laughs> I don't know, do you want to touch with that at all? Is it, is it? Sure. <laughs> yeah, so I had to learn the dance in a couple of weeks, um, which was amazing. Uh, it's an awesome challenge, um, but it's really interesting to come into the final stages of um, a work that's been researched for two plus two-ish years, yeah. year and a half, year and a half. Um, and yeah, to try to not only, I don't think I ever came in with the intention of trying to fill, fill the shoes of, um, of Nicole, the dancer I've replaced temporarily, uh, but, um, but definitely, we've we've had lots of conversations about energy, um, and yeah, it's very interesting. Also, it's a it's a new language. So, um, yeah, I um, holding on to my. Own. <laughs> I think at first, I mean, I kept saying to you, like, it's gonna, like, it might look vanilla at first. Like, it might look vanilla at first. Like, just give me, like, back off. Give me just like, I need bones right now. Um, but I don't know, I think um, performance is a very um, interesting, just the, the, the performance part of, of all of this is also research. And I, I always find that I'm able to f really find my own voice, especially in a, a situation like this through performing. So, um, yeah. Kelly definitely has stayed in contact with her own voice because I know this role through another dancer and it's so, so different. So <laughs> Kelly's version of it is very, you know, anchored in Kelly, which is how I want it to be. That's how I want my dances to be inhabited. And, uh, can anyone else answer this question of how you stay connected to voice? Uh, as far as my experience is concerned, I think there's kind of a gestation period where you're in it and you, at least for myself, felt a little disconnected from that and lost as to where I fit in and where my flavor came through. And then for me, there was a point where I realized that Kate wasn't looking for a people pleaser. She like wasn't looking for you to do it right, <laughs> you know? Um, and once she encourages that pushback and that responsibility and independence of speaking up for yourself and allowing your personality to come through within her movement. So for me, it was trusting myself and being able to push that forward almost onto Kate of like, well, here's what I have to say. And then immediately it was kind of like, well, yeah, I trust that. Like if, if you're living in it and you're believing it and you've committed to Kate's process and are willing to be foolish and looked at yada yada, pyramid of all these things, then the freedom kind of comes forward. And the other thing just structurally is that we're allowed and encouraged to create a lot of the movement as well. So we have workshop periods to go into different parts of the room and make stuff up with Julie and I have created something, Doug and I and Kayla have created something and then that really is your own because Kate doesn't know what you made and then you show it and then it gets tweaked and crafted but you have the, you have the essence because you made it. So. There are so many outlets into that, and then it's just you know exploring different possibilities and learning from each other. Like Kayla, I've learned a lot, and Doug and Julian and Kelly, I've added all these tools. And Ryan, sorry, I didn't see you over there. Oh my god! <laughs> I'm so sorry. That was only. 
me because I didn't see you riot. Yeah. <laughs> I had so much riot. <laughs> like all the time. But I, I wanted to say one thing that, that can be slightly tragic about so dancers do generate material in this process, and then you're not, you can't get attached to your material because I'm constantly looking at the way different dancers might interpret the same material. So material is often transferred and it doesn't belong to you anymore, or it's rejiggered and like this, <laughs> and that can be very painful, right? You made something, you're attached to it, and but someone else inflects it differently that is more useful to me. So. All the time, yeah. I think that, that's an interesting question. Um, different processes have different ratios. I don't know if I can answer that in a clean cut way. Um, I've been dealing with knee injuries in the last couple of years, and so my ability to embody the movement is a little less right now, but I actually don't feel like my voice presence is any less, actually. Um, because I've come to believe that being a choreographer is about like becoming aware of your perception. Um, more, even more than what movement you make. Um, but generation of movement, I mean, I still feel like, um, no, the dancers participate. Whether they generate the material or not, they're enormously involved in all aspects of the creative process. They are my collaborators. So I don't even see it about who makes the steps. To me, that's kind of irrelevant. And, and also, steps are just steps. They're fodder, right? They don't necessarily inherently, maybe form has meaning, but you know, steps are steps, yeah. Yes. You spoke about Chris Lancaster, one of my amazing musicians. Amazing musician. I, yeah. I would like to um, ask you to talk to us, talk to us about your process of choosing music. Uh, the snippets that I heard were essentially very simplistic, but very decisively complex. Yeah. Parts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yes, please. I'm sorry. That's a really good point because um, I, when I collaborate with a composer, that's also a very intimate collaboration. And Curtis McDonald did the score for Marksman, and um, I feel like our process was really interesting. We both did a lot of spitballing, and what I mean by that is throwing ideas up against each other and having a kind of collaborative dialogue that way. Like, how does this resonate? What is this? Um, is this interesting? How could this be pushed in a different direction? I mean, sound really influences the way you interpret movement. You know, it's a, it's a vital lens. And Dark Lark has this really, um, what's the word, narrative, cinematic score that is over the top. And, and when Chris plays it, man, <laughs> it's a really dominant, domineering score um, in a wonderful, passionate, blood-filled way. And I wish I could represent that on tour, but it's hard to recreate live sound, as I said. Curtis is a, is a, is a cerebralite, and you can feel that in the score, and there's a kind of abstraction in the work, but it also has feeling, energetic feeling in it, which is what I was really interested. I, I gravitated toward Curtis because I wanted to deal in energy, and I feel like he, he's a saxophonist and an improviser. He comes from a jazz background, and I feel like he accessed he accesses energy in his music, and we found ways to make those ideas bounce or play with each other. So um, the score is really interesting for Marksman. I think it's a it's a fascinating score, actually. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, I, just for the dancers, what were you doing before? Or like, how did you meet Kate, and when did you start getting involved in the company? Like, what did you transition from and to? Yeah. Well, I met Kate, uh, she was a guest artist when I was in school, and I kind of stalked her in New York. <laughs> so, <laughs> at VCU. <laughs> yeah, I'm at VCU. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, so I, Kate was a guest artist. I worked with her my senior year of college, and then when I moved to New York, um, got hired as an apprentice, and then uh, stayed on. Um, well, I wanted to go to Kate's Intensive for like two years, 
And every summer it never worked out. And then last summer it did. Mm -hmm. So I went to the Gibney workshop, saw you there, we danced. Um, <laughs> and so, <laughs> um, it's, yeah, no. um, so kind of got to play then. And then we did the big audition. Greg was there. Um, a really giant audition, a really big one. In, Kyle, Abraham, Brian Brooks, and just everyone in all one room. Um, in September of last year? Oh, 600 people. Um, and that's when we decided to move forward. And now I'm doing dance moves with Kate. Uh, I met Leslie, who I danced with. We were working at, it's kind of a funny story. We were working at a yoga studio together and we had um, just been chatting and became fast friends. and. Um, she was like, I work for this woman, and Kate was only you, it was you, Kate, it was you, Kate, Kate, <laughs> Leslie, and Andy um, at the time, and she was like, we're having a little audition, we're looking for people, would you want to come in? Leslie had never seen me dance before, we just hung out and wrote down, and so <laughs> I was like, yeah, let's go, and that's how that happened, 2007, and here I am. Uh... This guy was my way in. Uh, <laughs> uh, here. Yeah, Doug and I go way back, um, but we had some conversations at the end of last summer. I went to a couple of rehearsals in the fall, and then we left it as off at a, I'll be calling you, maybe, hopefully. And uh, yeah, and here I am. Um, I was apprenticing with Bill T. Jones for the year before I met Kate, and then went to the audition that Kayla's talking about, and it worked out, came in for a callback, and then started apprenticing a couple, or like a month later, and then here we are. How long is it? I'm in September, yeah. About, about six years ago, I went into one of your rep workshops with Andy. Yeah. We met then. We became Facebook friends, she went to the shows. <laughs> um, and then things ended with me and Steven, and I'm like, hey, Kate, what's going on? <laughs> Since, for two years now? If it's not therapeutic, why is it not therapeutic, or what is it? Um, okay, it's not therapeutic in the sense that my mother-in-law is a therapist, actually, sitting right here. Um, and um, <laughs> it's not therapeutic in this, in, directly in this sense. I am not in service to them, and I'm not taking care of them. So I don't know if a therapist feels like they're taking care of a client, but I, um, my, I care very much for my dancers, and, and I need to create enough safety in our relationship that they can explore in front of me, but ultimately my first fidelity is to pursue meaning, the meaning I'm interested in, and they're there to help me do that. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's not therapeutic as far as like she's not what she said, but I think it, there's she, that she creates a space that she wants to like build you up. She wants to make you into this dancer that you want to be, that you want to be, you know what I mean? Uh, that's what you try to do as a teacher, that you try to do, uh, as I do as a teacher, but as a choreographer, you're trying to cultivate that same thing, that fire within you that is, makes you the dancer that you are. She's trying to pull that out of you and let everything else fall away because it's not useful. So that's one of the main things is that she's always trying to just dig in and find out what makes you, you as a dancer, because we're all different. We all have these amazing attributes and she wants to, put those up and bring them out and let everyone see them. 
And I also feel like it's very useful for me to have a master sergeant in the room. Uh, Doug is a very effective assistant director in that he can help hone performance and kind of um, embodiment, and he also knows the history of my work very deeply. Julian's been really useful because he's not afraid to be mean. <laughs> and he, <clears throat> or very, just what I mean by that is just very direct and say it like he sees it. It's a very, he's a very clinical watcher of movement, which the way a good rehearsal director should be, like a technician. Yeah. Yeah. I think what we're, we're talking about is there's a space where it's okay to fail. So we, we work a lot on ideas like we'll look at something, is that interesting? Does this work? And if it doesn't, it just, we, we toss it and we keep moving. If there's nothing's precious enough to really like, well, except for floor architecture, we, we stuck with that for a really long time. Yeah, but we'll fight through. yeah, sometimes we'll really push through something if we know that there's a kernel at the end that's gonna be useful for whatever we're working on. Something miraculously comes back. That's true, you rescued that. Um, <laughs> But I, I do feel like one thing I want to say, I don't know if this is useful to those of you who are making work, but I don't believe in, um, I'm a very supportive director, but I'm also very exacting. And the thing I will do for my performers is tell them the truth about what I see. But I will never be cruel, because it doesn't serve my purposes. You know, I, my purpose is to empower a performer to own the material, and that's what's gonna serve my work. I don't do it out altruism. I do it because I want the strongest material on stage, I think.